thank you for uh, being with us for our first Touchstone Cinema screening of 2024, Virtual Structures of Sabotage, featuring works by Aria Dean and New Red Order. Before we begin, um, we would like to say um, a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, for the Studio for Creative Inquiry, um, and for the Center for Arts and Society for supporting our programming. Um, this program was made possible by a Steiner Visitor Invitation Grant and a joint support from CAS. Thank you to uh, Nika, Harrison, Bill, and Linda at the studio for facilitating and hosting tonight's program. And thank you to uh, Wendy Ahrens and the casting for sponsoring and promoting the event. Um, we won't belabor introductions as there will be plenty of time for discussion in the panel and Q&A to follow the screening. Um, but we will say a few words about Touchstone Cinema and I'm gonna pass the mic to Becca. Wait, I need the paper. <laughs> oh, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, Touchstone Cinema is an ongoing screening series curated by Imbar and myself, dedicated to facilitating discourse around artworks that challenge and push the boundaries of cinematic form. We began this series as moving image artists ourselves and avid watchers of avant-garde cinema, eager to create dialogue between artists we admire and works we love with our community here in Pittsburgh. We are driven by a deep wish to celebrate, celebrate Pittsburgh's prolific filmmaking history and to establish a space for consistent discourse around the cinematic form between practitioners, cinephiles, scholars, and curious minds alike. Tonight's program pairs two digital video works that explore the, possible, the possibilities of virtual 3D modeled spaces to make incisive critiques of architectural manifestations of violent systems. The first film uh, will be Aria Dean's Abattoir USA. Oh, I lied, sorry. The first film will be Culture Capture Crimes Against Reality by New Red Order, followed by Aria Dean's Abattoir USA. And without further ado, enjoy the screening. Thank you for braving the snow. Our panelists are going to be joining us via Zoom. So as we switch over to that perspective, I'm just gonna give very brief um, introductions. I encourage you all to look up the full bios of our participants on either the studio website or um, on um, Cass's site, because I'm giving abridged versions and all of our participants are very accomplished artists in their own right. So New Red Order is a public secret society facilitated by core contri contributors, Jackson Polly's, Adam Khalil, and Zach Khalil. Polly's is a multidisciplinary artist who examines negotiations toward the limits and viabilities of desires for indigenous growth. Adam Khalil is a filmmaker and artist whose practice attempts to subvert traditional forms of image making through humor, relation, and transgression. Zach Khalil is a filmmaker and artist whose work explores an indigenous worldview and undermines traditional forms of historical authority through the excavation of alternative histories and the use of innovative documentary forms. Aria Dean is an artist, writer, and filmmaker based in New York City, whose work across moving image, writing, sculpture, and installation mounts a critique of representational systems, examining the structures of individual and collective subjectivity in relation to aesthetics, cultural histories, and technologies. And uh, without further ado, we'll begin our panel. Maybe to start us off, um, it would be great if you guys can share a little bit about um, just how you started um, working and um, tell us a little bit about your influence, influences um, before um, approaching the work process. Who should go first? <laughs> Aria, you could start us off since, yeah, if you're okay with that. Since I'm one person. Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, hi, I'm Aria. Thank you for having me. Um, it's cool to 
yeah, to be here um, or yeah, virtually uh, and to yeah, show these films together. I think it's like a really amazing program. It's really exciting. Um, but yeah, so with this film, um, it's the second film I've made using um, like a game engine. Uh, I don't do the like the programming myself. I've worked with other people and I'm not uh, gifted in that in that sense. Um, but with this in particular, I mean, I'm not, I haven't been, it didn't start out as like a, something I was interested in for its sake. I initially, when I first was working on the project, wanted to shoot in a real slaughterhouse and make a sort of like, just like straightforward, like structural film, just like kind of like a camera rotating around like the architecture of a slaughterhouse and like just getting a sort of 360 view. But I couldn't get access to any spaces. And I think also as I was doing the research around um, slaughterhouses and kind of just like kind of yeah, splashing through like the last like 200 years of history and like architecture and like um, industrial developments, it kind of became clear too that like choosing a single slaughterhouse wouldn't really work because it was really about this like slaughterhouse as type or sort of like generic um, infrastructure. So uh, yeah, kind of moved towards this idea like, hey, maybe it'd be better to just like make a slaughterhouse and sort of be able to design the whole space. Um, and so, yeah, so I worked with this wonderful animator and artist, um, Philip Caustic, who's based in LA and we designed it, um, not, I guess not from scratch, but using like a lot of open source, like 3d objects, um, and then building some things like the stun box that you see, like that just didn't exist. Like, cause no one seems like no one really has wanted to use a stun box in anything they were making. So we built that. Um, and yeah, I mean like with the, so I guess on the sort of formal side with the game aesthetic. I don't know that I have like a lot of info. I mean, I played video games as a kid, not like intensely, but I have a younger brother. We played a lot of like Star Wars Battlefront and Call of Duty. So I think that stuff is like in my head. And I, I used to work at Rhizome at the museum. We did a lot of stuff about, um, you know, game, like game mod work and stuff like that. So I think there's like some of that I definitely was like in there, but then and I also like, I guess in college, I liked like Ed Atkins a lot and, and you know, like have been in dialogue with like Jordan Wolfson. So I feel like there's there, but but it all kind of just happened because it made sense for what we were trying to do. But then I think the actual sort of influences and in, that I was thinking through and making it were more, yeah, again, it kind of was this wager about structural film and materialist film, like kind of like, can I make, can I in this moment, like with my, I guess like interests or just like my sensibility, like what would, it happened if I tried to make a, a structural film and just kind of make something that's just uh, like, you know, imaging this thing. But so yeah, there are like references to like, but then it kind of just got all like, it, it drifted away from that. And it's like kind of more of this, like maybe like homage or like jokey love letter to those histories. Cause those are the things that I really think about a lot, but I also love like narrative cinema. So like kind of, I'm, I'm bad at, at um, sticking to my guns and, and only doing, um, you know, like, like really like serious materialist work but they're you know the like flashing light section definitely like was like a reference to like you know flicker film and like paul sheritz and then in 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 totality the whole thing has a lot of like michael snow kind of like creeping in the background um for me just like you know in some ways like a love letter to him um and yeah and then also like yeah like documentary um you know sort of film like the, like a lot of time when showing this film, like the George Fungu, um Blood of the Beast film comes up. And so little things like that. Um, but a lot of, but I think with every reference point, it's like this push and pull where like, I'm really interested in like, I was interested in figuring out how to drag those things into the present and like specifically also with like my subjectivity and we probably can get into that like later, but also kind of not like being, not having to assent too much of like a sense of fidelity to those things. Yeah, but yeah. And then if you, if each member of New Red Order could just like introduce yourselves, because we know who you are, but not everyone does. Hi, I'm uh, Zach Lee, one of the members of New Red Order. Uh, Khalil, another core contributor to New Red Order, and also Zach's brother. I'm Jackson Paulus um, from Alaska, um, core contributor to New Red Order. Um, yeah, to, to, I guess to begin to address the, the question, I really loved Aria hearing, hearing about the, uh, the inspiration behind that film. Really, really loved that, that work. Um, for our own film, Culture Capture Crimes Against Reality, 
I think the sort of kernel of inspiration uh, was a residency we did at Syracuse University on a totally unrelated project. Um, and Adam has spent some more time up there than the rest of us and had some time to dig into their archives. Um, and surprisingly, they had the, the entire uh, archive of the famed American sculptor, uh, James Earl Fraser, who uh, made two of the sculptures out of the three sculptures that were in that piece. Um, he's sort of like one of the most famous American propagandists. Um, he's like sort of America's national sculptor. Um, he sculpted the uh, uh, Indian head buffalo nickel, as well as like the, the pediment on the National Archives in DC. Um, and in some ways you could kind of be considered like the, the Lenny Riefenstahl of American settler colonial propaganda. His most famous sculpture, uh, which was featured in this piece uh, was The End of the Trail, uh, which features a Native American kind of slumped over on a horse, uh, supposedly perched on, the, on a cliff on the Pacific coast, uh, kind of literalizing uh, manifest destiny, pushing Native Americans off, to, off the edge. Um, and of course, the other monument featured there is Theodore Roosevelt's equestrian monument. Um, I think Fraser was a really interesting figure for us, and we didn't want to just um, uh, just do iconoclasm and just disparage him in a way. Uh, his archive was really a, a kind of treasure trove of getting to know his thinking and inspiration behind his works and learning about what he actually thought about Native American people and, and why he thought that and why he chose to represent Native people the, the way that he did. Um, his, his, the archive also included a, a unpublished memoir he wrote called Little Boy on Indian Prairie that sort of documented his time growing up. Um, uh, his father was uh, an engineer on the railroad in Dakotas, uh, so he was really a part of Manifest Destiny and Westward Expansion, and he has these really rose-tinted glasses and memories of, of growing up uh, with Native children. Um, and I think for his time could be considered kind of like a, a bleeding heart liberal in a way. Um, but also, I think for us, uh, it was really important to get at um, to get at the the deeper intentions behind his sculptures and to think about the um, very real violence, uh, both representational and physical, that they that they enacted in many different ways. Um, I think for us, that initial kernel of, of getting access to that archive with all those glass plate negatives and, and writing um, just caused us to look a lot deeper into his work. Um, and that combined with, um, back in 2017, Bill de Blasio's uh, commission on problematic monuments in New York, uh, where they were starting to rethink some monuments in New York City, in particular the uh, Columbus Monument and the Theodore Roosevelt Equestrian Monument, um, caused us to, to think about interpreting these sculptures um, in, a, in a different way, um, uh, virtually. Maybe Adam Jackson could pick up there. Yeah, maybe also just the. Uh... To keep things extra weird, James Earl Fraser's wife, Lisa Gardner Fraser, was also a public sculptor who specialized in Confederate monuments. So that's cute. They have like this epic studio. Um, yeah, I guess maybe thinking about like the influences or what we were thinking around that time. It's also kind of unpacking this idea that Michael Tausig has around additive defacement, um, and especially with the the Roosevelt Monument outside of the American Museum of Natural History and kinds of direct actions that had been going on to deface that monument. And like Zach was saying, this this, this group that de Blasio put together, um, their kind of conclusion after meeting, and it was like a weird mix of like academics and activists and art historians trying to figure out, and, and um, civil servants or like government employees trying to figure out what to do with these quote unquote problematic monuments and the resolution after like six or nine months of meeting was to put plaques next to it, giving context. Um, and I guess there's also this fear that we have about the erasure of indigenous representation, which even though like these monuments are problematic, they're also a reminder of the dispossession and displacement of indigenous people and lives. Um, so it's kind of this double bind in terms of wanting to see this kind of representational corrective, but also it bleeds into this erasure and historical amnesia. Um, so I think Taussig's idea of additive defacement was something that was really appealing to us, where it's kind of like using, using the material as opposed to just hiding it away somewhere. And that kind of like opened up a lot of thinking in terms of 
how we would approach things like photogrammetry and maybe I'll let Jackson talk a bit about. Yeah, I guess I guess to expand briefly on on the notion that of erasure, just knowing that removal for native people is uh, a dirty word that brings up a lot of um, trauma for a lot of people in terms of their own um, histories of removal on this continent. Um, to get back to kind of the historical timeline, um, kind of around the same time that that monument uh, protests were going on, specifically with the Theodore Roosevelt Monument in front of the American Museum of Natural History, um, in like 2016, 17, um, there were also moves being made to um, update the Hall of Northwest Coast Peoples. So at least for me, and, and I think for us as well, like looking at the ways in which um, institutions offered at that time, the promise of a virtual repatriation, that is not giving the objects back, but offering to do the photogrammetry themselves and then making reproductions with CNC or um, and then hand painted commissioning native artists to then finish those and then have those be in the community. So thinking about the partiality of that at the same time that um, photogrammetry was kind of becoming a trend by, you know, Autodesk and others offering for the first time at that moment, like iPhone free apps for photogrammetry that were phased out then, but then have since been like more radically reintroduced. Um, thinking of, what, of the ways that in which the photogrammetric capture uh, mirrors capture and other forms of native people. This idea to, to save the Indian before it's gone, which is also epitomized in James Earl Fraser's move in the end of the trail statue, for example. Um, so I think, yeah, there's this, this idea of photogrammetry and then the manipulation of that without the removal, but then letting the kind of disruption become evident formally and through, through the work, um, I think for us felt like a, a way of inverting that kind of um, salvaged ethnography, especially when we, we st moved instead from like native ceremonial objects and introducing that as a provocation and then shifting it to the, the monuments. Um, so. Yes, thank you. Um... NRO members, um, watching this the work this time made me um, uh, very curious about your decision to um, incorporate um, those quick, rapid, still um, sequences with the virtual um, manipulation of the monuments. Um, and I also noticed how you actually incorporated the 3D um, scanning process in one of those sequences. Um, can you talk a little bit about the decision to incorporate those two types of footage together and also to almost refer to the actual process of scanning within the, the work? Oh yeah, well, I guess just uh, to give a quick intro to anybody who doesn't know about it, uh, photogrammetry. So like photogrammetry is a basic process of where you take a series of photos of an object and uh, 360 degrees around it, hopefully at at least maybe three different heights. Uh, and though you let a uh, software process those images and turn it into a, a 3D object. Um, so that so what you were seeing there uh, was, was the process in action, right? You're seeing one frame per second, um, of, of each of those photos that was used uh, and then translated into the object, the 3D object itself. Uh, for us, I think it was kind of important to, to place that also within the, the context of the archival images that we had access to, the, the glass plate negatives, um, the sort of uh, rush of images of uh, James Earl Frazier's life, I, uh, and not just his, his sculptures and his work, but also his family life um, and a lot of other things. Um, I think it was important for us to think about how we could kind of capture him in a way uh, and capture his own desire for indigeneity and, and have that be something on display in the piece as much as the, the 3D sculptures themselves were on display. Um, I think also personally for me, I think the flicker is uh, just a, an effect that uh, is, is really near and, and dear to our hearts. It's something we really enjoyed at Inari's film as well. Um, and then I think that the rapid montage of those historical images too um, kind of gets at um, 
this uh, unknowable uh, thrust and force of, of history uh, of, of these traumatic events and realities that perhaps can't be fully comprehended um, in, in words uh, and sometimes maybe needs to be felt as, a, as an overwhelming sensation of sorts. Also, there's a kind of like a pedagogical bent to a lot of our work and like it's kind of tied to this larger recruitment campaign and shameless plug if anyone wants to join the public secret society of new red order you can call toll free at one eight 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 new red one or sign up at newredorder.org um and culture capture was this kind of uh one one step in 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 working through becoming an accomplice with New Red Order, this idea that people could be recruited to kind of um, clandestinely capture culture back from institutions and museums, and that this this monument turn was a bit of a shift from that, but also uh, just kind of tying back also this idea that we have about savage philosophy, that um, that representations make realities. And the kind of like absurdity of that reality in and of itself and wanting to kind of play in that muck a bit and also kind of expose how we were doing that while doing it. I kind of have a comment just going off of what you just said and looking at the two works together about like the stability and instability of images in both works. Like there's an incredible feeling of stability at times, Aria, in your piece as we're walking in this perspective and then the flicker kind of breaks that sense and at the end there's there's also these in shots that are like topsy-turvy that feel like you as a viewer have lost stability and then for New Red Order like the moments where the the 3D object fully forms feels almost stable and then kind of breaks down again and I was wondering if you could just both comment on that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think that like, yeah, the part, the, the thing, the thing that I left out in, in talking about um, the like initial impetus for the film also is like, I was doing all this reading about reading like a lot of like Afro pessimist writing and a lot of George Bataille. And there's this like the slaughterhouse is brought up in both of these lines of thought. And I got really interested in this overlap. And there's a lot of like other stuff related to that, that kind of it's like about this like question of like, but Ty talking about the slaughterhouse directly as a material phenomenon, and then like Frank Wilderson talking about it as this like kind of analogy for blackness um, and like the structural position, structural position of black people in America. But the whole point of the film, and for me, in terms of its like investigation of like it's like formal investigation, also was this question of stability. Like, what perspective are you in? So kind of choosing to like stick it in the lineage of like first person point of view, um, you know, like cinematic experiments or just like popular cinema going you know way way back um and then using the unreal engine which has like this very like you know weird like the floaty video game kind of camera feel like you don't i personally think you don't think you feel like you're you know an object like seeing from an, the perspective of an object that has weight it feels very weightless but then it is like you know then narratively you are like in the perspective of an animal going through this process and then um you know in terms of like anal analogy or metaphor or something there's like a variety of other perspectives that you can then map this onto, whether it's the Wilderson um, Blackness in America thing, or like, you know, a variety of other enclosures made for killing um, that one, you know, could or couldn't find oneself in, depending on one's like, structural or just like anecdotal position. So yeah, so like, we kind of strove to work that in formally to really have it sort of, um, yeah, like scramble itself as you're going and, and, and hard in at moments and you know feel like very like uh clear and then also I guess inserting some things where you know the perspective of like when the animal quote-unquote dies then also gets swept up you know by the hooks uh before going into the thing like that like then you know it's like the animal is dead but you're seeing the perspective of like the hooks but there's no animals so kind of like the blurring like all these different um positions one could be like witnessing the architecture um, from, and then kind of with that, hopefully, I think that the main hope has been to, in the context of viewing, whether it's in a cinema or installation context, having the viewer, the viewer's primary experience being one of like, sort of like it folding over on itself and the viewer trying to, trying to place oneself and trying to figure out like, at what level am I 
experiencing this or identifying with this or um, deconstructing or constructing this experience or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I can go ahead. <laughs> I'm trying to give everyone a chance to speak. Um, talking about, um, I guess the, the kind of con return, the continuous return to instability, I'll say, and yeah, culture capture. Um, yeah, I, I think I think part of what, what we're interested in and kind of reflecting after the fact too, um, is it's just like the fundamental instability of American identity in the first place, right? I think it's uh, you know it's easy to forget how new this country is in so many ways um, and how recent um, and ongoing uh, you know this uh, genocidal settler colonial project is. Um, and I think there's a real sensation of, of sort of being inside of it and really contemplating and having the, the floor constantly sort of fall out from under you. Um, a sort of endless sensation of, of falling and, and trying to orient oneself within that. And I think that like Frazier is grasping towards like monumentality and, and making um, the sort of imaginary Indians in his head, uh, these sort of concrete um, structures that will live forever in, in his mind. Um, I think there's a, a desire to sort of point out the, the desperation maybe and that and sort of the absurdity of that process um, and and to sort of um, to unsettle the audience to, to unsettle uh, us from the ground that we're they're standing we're standing on and to, to think more deeply about it. Yeah, I guess in another sense to extend that it would, um, you know, thinking of Frazier's or the creation of monuments or the, or the creation of monuments in general are proceed through a kind of ossification of the body. Um, so what happens when that is reversed? Can that, what happens if that the reversal of that is depicted as a possible as it might seem, um, where does that representation go? And I think for, for us, this is also related to this desire for indigeneity, like where, where can that go? How can there be channels through which one can pursue, um, a love for, <laughs> for native people or a support for native people that resists incorporation into the nation state or the resists this kind of, um, telos or end point of being incorporated into an institution, or for example, like what's depicted photogrammetrically in this film was the, the kind of great hall in front of the American wing in the, in the Met. So how can one kind of through the isolation of the capture, um, through the through the archival impulse, the isolation of those three monuments, and then the kind of merger that is in some ways being embodied or depicted in the film, and then into a between in that institution, and then the kind of disappearance of that, I think, is something that uh, opens up a question that we are remain interested in. We pay extension of that, just the kind of inevitable impermanence of any archive or collection and, and trying to point to that into some kind of way. Also Flickr's cool. It was cool seeing uh, the, um, uh, one of the cameras, you can't see the screen, but you could see the lights on the side of the wall. <laughs> I think it was after the camera went into that uh the closed eye section. It was really sick from <laughs> whatever. Sorry. It's late over here. <laughs> um I'm thinking maybe we can ask one more question before we go to uh audience questions. Um we were curious, um, Aria, um, about your choice. Um um, of the song, um, which is very surprising because it, it kind of breaks something in the atmosphere you are building uh, in the work until that moment. And then when the song um, comes up, and I'm not sure, like, I don't know exactly um, where that music is from or what song it is. And maybe you can talk a little bit more about that and about that choice. Um, it's almost like, opposite to the coldness of the um, game engine world and the slaughter, the virtual slaughterhouse. Um, 
So yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about that choice. Yeah. Um, so I think it like operates on a number of levels. I think one kind of going back to what I was saying about sort of being bad at and um, sort of adhering to the like, yeah, conceptual um, parameters of the actual like movements in film that I'm interested in. Like I just, I, I get bored or I get, you know, like antsy and I want something to feel a little fun. Maybe it's like an anxious choice as a filmmaker, kind of like, oh, like I need to make it. But I think with this, it was, you know, the, yeah, the subject matter, my relationship with subject matter is very serious, but I think it also kind of goes back to some of the stuff that you guys are saying about like, you know, making a project that's critical of, yeah, you know, like, yeah, like, building architecture for structural violence or like, yeah, the nation state being one of those, like, and then kind of also being, I think from the perspective of like, at least my relationship to that, my relationship to being a black American, and then the relationship I think like that a lot of like black Americans at this point in like history are expressing or sort of this absurdity. And I feel like I couldn't imagine making the film in this sort of like straight faced way that was like, you know, it's not, um, doesn't operate in a sort of I think it also felt important to like undercut maybe an impulse to like be like and now you've seen you've seen like the sort of like we've peeled back the the walls and now you see the slaughterhouse it kind of turns it into something else that um and then also sonically the composer I work with and I we talked a lot about like again because it has this preoccupation with narrative cinema trying to we we're working through a lot of things about like how images and sound relate to each other in popular film like melodrama and so initially talked a lot about pushing against that and like trying to deconstruct narrative but it then it kind of just felt as we were like working on it it felt natural to like there was a natural um arc towards narrative so a lot of that earlier stuff is like thinking about like their reference points to like early Hollywood studio films and like romantic era music and like also just weird things like grindcore and like just you know things that felt right um and then in the end but the song that, that we that I chose it was very last it was kind of like the last minute like the last thing last few weeks before the original um installation of it and we couldn't figure out what to do but I knew I wanted it to have like a different texture and um I heard the original version of the song I think we're alone now that's like usually known the 80s version is the popular one it's by Tiffany um but the original one is by Tommy James and like the Blondells or Shondells or something and it has this like fantastic bass line and I was like and I had previously titled a sculpture that was also made through like digital kind of it's like yeah like I make these sculptures that are like like collisions and like simulations and are made in three dimensions but I titled that I think we're alone now and it was these two cubes like kissing and so I was kind of like oh this is you know a weird like thing that I already referenced and then kind of brought it back in and then also I think that it became this it creates if you know the name of the song or if anyone tells you the name of the song creates this riddle kind of because there's no one there but then like you're kind of I think it throws everything back into the space of viewing where suddenly it's like okay well who's here it's purely the audience and then kind of the film maybe is like in some ways maybe it's like me as the filmmaker shouting at the audience like okay like I have you here or it's the audience forced to kind of reckon with each other in the space or if you're alone so I don't know I think kind of creating this like big question mark in that way um but yeah I think also just like filmically or like style wise I think I kind of like yeah again it's like I'm constantly like battling with this like best friend slash bully of like sort of political experimental materialist film that I like love then I'm like okay but like I want to like I just I get like kind of like I'm like anal retentive and I'm like ah explosion and I want to like do something like that so kind of satisfied an itch for me and also yeah and part of it too is that like initially I wanted to build a synthesizer that used like cow moves as like like pitched up and down as part of the thing but it like it just didn't really but the composer I worked with he was kind of like not that interested in it and then we didn't do it and then at the end of it he I knew I wanted to use this song and then we couldn't figure out how to incorporate it and then he sent me like an iPhone note that was just like a cow like singing it and he was like this is too stupid right and I was like no I think it's actually perfectly stupid and then we had um this really great cellist Nikki Weatherall uh just like sent us a voice note of like him doing it on cello and put those things together and then at the end it also if you can I don't know if you can hear it where you guys are watching it but like there's a little like recording ending kind of click that kind of happens and I think that also is just like as a you know someone who 
grew up in the like or came to like art and culture through like blog era music it's kind of felt like it's like 90s and 2000s like, like indie rock like lo-fi kind of thing that just aesthetically is and I think counters again yeah the like coldness and the um you know the video gameness of it anyway, sorry like yeah no that's great and um we lied. I want to ask you guys one more question because I feel like it keeps coming up about a question of liveness and like how NRO brings liveness in this really kind of grotesque way, like this life force that seems to end in a vitrine and then the absence of liveness or presence in the point of view in your piece, Aria, or like that we know it's a place where there are people who labor. We know it's a place where there are... Um, there is livestock, right? But in your work, there's a kind of a depletion of that. So I guess what I'm asking is like, can you speak about like the way you uh, handle a question of liveness in both works or a life force I would use more specifically to NRO's work? Yeah, it's kind of uh, a resurrection of sorts. Or like a, a return to something. I think I worked for a while with this filmmaker who was obsessed with immortality and resurrection uh, based off this kind of like wacky Soviet, Soviet cosmism ideas, including that like they had these slogans from the 1920s saying libraries should become laboratories for the resuscitation of dead writers. It's like this weird kind of <laughs> collision of material culture to promote actual life. Um, and how that kind of can can run counter to a lot of kind of indigenous epistemologies about liveness, thinking also about like salvage ethnography is uh, this kind of ridiculous hoarding gesture to keep something alive, but it actually removes any life that it has by by sequestering it away and trying to like kind of reverse those roles or reverse that process a bit. Please go. Ahead. I can, I can go quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing about liveness, I mean, I think one, yeah, like the whole, at every stage of the project, it was always like definitely going to be something that didn't have any viscera. Like that was like clear to me because I think I also just like, I'm interested in like the structure. I think that was like the only way to like, I think in general in my work, it's like I'm just very interested in structures and I recognize that probably absencing the body or something is the best way to you know or I try I think it helps it usually doesn't really it also creates I think in this case creates such an absence that I think it draws attention to the body which I understand through viewing it a lot but um also just the I think with liveness the main thing that that brings to mind for me is like the pro you know it's unreal engines so it's a real-time simulation and so showing it as a film like the and the animator I work with like close to the end of of making it he was like well you know we could just show this on the computer like we could run it live and it would be a performance and it like kind of like i was like oh it's too much for me to really like work through because it just you know in my mind i was like yeah we're making this thing and i'm this is the first time i worked like intimately with someone working with unreal engine so i was like that's too big of a concept for us to like bite off and, and think about because also the music had an element of that where like every time it shows an installation it's like reconfigured like for spatial like it's like you know the sound is spatialized so I think that thinking about the fact that it is kind of not actually a film, like insofar as like the camera isn't capturing anything and as Flip the animator has phrased it, I think better than that I could ever like, you know, the image is unfolding onto the lens within Unreal Engine. There's not like, well, we look this way and we capture something that's actually there. It's just completely generating, generating, generating. So I think like, yeah, that's the liveness that I think now I feel like I'm preoccupied with um, and, and I'm interested in working through like, what is that? mean it probably doesn't mean that much it doesn't mean that much experientially but I think it does I think also in dealing with like you know it's like it's not a fantastical like space like station set or something it's like a real it's very much like in the world of realism and so I think what we're now thinking through a lot on for future projects is also this idea of like cinematic realism in this kind of like production space which seems just like has interesting at least like you know philosophical implications but anyway so yeah Totally. Thank you both, or all four of you, really, <laughs> um, for your comments. And we'll just pivot to audience questions. So, yeah, Bill will come with, to you with Mike. <laughs> this one, this one. <laughs> Hi. 
Hi. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering if, so both pieces seem to me to be about um, denial. And I'm just wondering if there was any plans for like a revisionist, uh, revisionist pieces around this, you know, denial of where our food comes from and that it has to ha happens in a slaughterhouse <laughs> um, and denial of these monuments that, you know, that, that could have this uh, revision or that's what's implied by the, by way of all the, the 3D modeling. So that was, that was my question. Um, I can go first, I guess, or I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think like, yeah, I mean, the, the root of the project definitely did come from the Bataille stuff about like putting slaughterhouses outside of the city and, you know, that we need to sequester this kind of violence for society to appear healthy to us. And, you know, all and like freedom comes from that in some or the ideas of freedom. I, I, I think this is where like, I got kind of like, I'm not super concerned with the actuality of like food production. I mean, I think like, I'm, you know, in general, yes, like industrialized food production, et cetera, it does concern me, but it's not like my um, chosen, like, like, it's not why I made this, I suppose. Um, it's part of it, but I think it's like what that, what like the sort of action of sequestering things like that, that like what that is. I think the fact that it's like a model of a kind of relationship to violence or killing that is replicated across like not just capitalist societies, but maybe just like Western societies in certain ways, maybe beyond the West. And something I think I'm now kind of like a little bit stuck on in terms of like the um, like structures of meaning in relationship to the project. Like, is it, yeah, like is what, anyway. So I think it's about, it is about denial in that way. Um, and I guess about like the sort of exchange of energies between the spaces of denial and then the spaces of like supposed freedom. Um, uh but yeah and I read a lot of stuff about like like yeah like animal rights stuff in the process um but it yeah it seems like such a fact of of society in a way that like not like we shouldn't care about it but it's just kind of like creepily so baked in which is the again all these things are, are that it, this is pointing at maybe are that way but I don't know sorry short bad answer but yeah Uh, I guess to yeah to pick up there about that the idea of denial. I mean, I guess like the one denial is like yeah the denial of the reality of our ongoing settler colonial occupation, right? And I think part of this piece uh, tries to think about the ways in which we often think about archives and monuments as, as tools of memory, um, but I think from an indigenous perspective, uh, settler colonial use of archives and monuments are often like a, a tool for forgetting, actually, right? Like you can put this uh, terrible violent past and kind of seal it hermetically in an archive um, so that it can safely be forgotten about. You can always remember it later if you want to. Um, and I think monuments themselves too are um, are largely ignored and largely invisible as large as they are, right? I think there's like a famous quote, that there's like, there's nothing so as, in, as invisible as a monument, right? Um, and so I think, yeah, our, I think a lot, a lot of our effort was just uh, towards making clear how, how those are used as sort of structures of denial or forgetting um, and to, to use them to sort of awaken people to, to this reality, which we all experience every day. I kind of feel like monuments are impregnated with something that repels attention, causing the glance to roll right off like water droplets off an oil cloth without even pausing for a moment. Just kidding. That was that Robert Musil guy that Zach was quoting. Um, yeah, I also feel like maybe that, like this idea again of like additive defacement, like there's also a hope for like kind of uh, like exuberant or ex ec ecstasy that's like kind of in hopefully embedded a bit in the film to take this raw material of history and actually use it to construct something new. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, and I guess in, in some instance, or one way of thinking about it might be to think about the denial of that representation as also a participant in the de denial of its forgetting um, through its complete erasure. Like with additive defacement, there might be some cluster that might be kept alive that evokes some kind of memory of what it once was or what it might transform into later on. 
Um, and I think for us, there was also a kind of uh, active ambivalence about the potential of that um, equestrian monument in particular being removed and you know, feeling that uh, like once those monuments are removed, there's also something kind of, as much as that is a productive, uh, quote unquote, a progressive choice for society potentially, uh, I think we're also kind of aware of the ways in which people are reluctant to accept that. And this also aligns in maybe uncomfortable ways with our own reluctance at seeing that erasure, like with the Land O'Lakes, um, you know, logo or with the Redskins turning into the Washington football team and then the Washington commanders and what kind of a race, what kind of acceptance or invisibility um, that promotes or, or participates in, I think is, uh, yeah, this kind of resistance or refusal against complete erasure is something that's kind of always something we're thinking through. I think that also for me, like the sort of in making this I don't know what you're saying just makes me think too, but I think maybe since making the film, I've thought about this, I've been thinking about this more and like, you know, talking about like, I really like this, yeah, the additive defacement and like kind of exuberance and thinking about how to use these things. And like, actually really it's more like, I think like my sculptural work, I think kind of is like, I've been, that's how I've been thinking about things. And also this sort of resistance or refusal of like, this like melancholic attitude towards like the fate of, you know, like be, being like, oh, like, well, like settler colonialism, let's remember all the ways that this has just fucked us. And it's like, well, yes, but like, but, you know, crunch, like squashing it and crunching it and making it into like new um, things and new concepts. I think that's really exciting. And then also with like, with this film and then also, yeah, just like everything kind of since then, it's also like how to, I know there's so much, I think also in like sort of in the last five years, but like, like refusal and just like refusing the image overall and even in my own work. And I think in this way, it was like also this project was like a challenge of like, okay, like, you know, using yeah this space that is like that that is like the sort of way it's treated like we're just like you know sequestering it to sort of try to work through my own questions about like yeah like at what layer am i refusing things and where do i actually want to be like i don't know anyway so yeah any more questions anybody yes Hey, um, my name is Harrison, I work at the studio. And uh, when Inbar and Rebecca handed off the imagery for promoting it, I remember thinking that the, uh, the sort of fleshy, meaty bone texture, um, it looks like uh, granite or crystal, and I was just really struck by, the, by my own misreading and then seeing it in motion and how different that was. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the source imagery and what it felt like to apply that to the models and um, you know, kind of the, the fine tuning of the photogrammetry. Yeah, one thing we should we forgot to mention up front was um, uh, this was a direct, uh, very strong collaboration with Driftnote, um, an amazing animator and kind of 3D generalist um, who lives in Toronto. And so that process was, and Zach can speak more on this, I'm sure, but it was a, it was a long process of using um, different kind of surfacing or skinning and then creating those structures and then reapplying them to the actual monument that had already been disrupted physically with like Houdini or or these different, um, you know, not exactly collisions, but like this kind of noise disruption filtering that then gives you a different surface to project that those 3D materials back onto. Um, and so there was you know, a lot of back and forth in terms of finding those um, finding those surfaces and then finding the ways in which they would morph and the rates in which they would morph. Any other questions? I don't have a mic for... Um. Hello, um, I'm here in, in the people. Hi. <laughs> um, I, I guess bo both films use, you know, this uncanny, impossible, you know, digital space, like while photogrammetry is this way of like capturing, but you know, then there's the morphing and, 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 I, and I wonder like, 
you know, since you've made these films, like, is this is this a space that you continue to think and 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 make in 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 this like surreal, uncanny space? And where do you like? What do you feel is the power of this kind of simulation, impossible space in in what you're trying to say and what you're making? Um, I'm definitely interested, and in, I mean, I think I I'd never thought that I would be, but I think after doing this. It's, yeah, it's really compelling. Like right now, the team that I, like the composer and the animator that I worked with on this, we're working on trying to make a feature length um, project that's like an adaptation of this Salon Robe Grier novel, Jalousie, that takes place on like a banana plantation in like a French colony in the waiting, waiting days of French colonialism. And like, basically, I mean, the sort of next, it's like a step up, like a step forward from this where like, we'll shoot it, we'll like make this environment and and make it really like, you know, actually planning to use photogrammetry and like go like take scans of buildings and like build out this, you know, kind of, cause in the book, it's like the map is very specific of how the house operates. So you couldn't really like build the set. Like it's kind of requires almost like shooting something this way, but then adding people to it and having actors. Um, and essentially like what we're <laughs> really building ourselves up to is like, it's the same way that things like the you know, Marvel movies and like the Mandalorian, like new David Fincher films are shot like on volume stages, but we kind of have this like thesis that, you know, those things don't need to cost anywhere near what they cost. It's just about like, you know, access and, and labor time. So we're um, working on doing that. And that excites me. I think kind of the, the book is a perfect experiment for like, a like, like cinematic realism and, you know, the sort of like Rogue's whole like philosophy of literature, basically, I think, like is begging to, <laughs> to um, be imaged using this stuff. So that's exciting and then yeah and like in other prod I think it, it feels like a shortcut honestly for me like to like creating like and if, if that works then it's like shooting like period like specific stuff um but then also being able to manipulate space also manipulating sound like you can you know play sound diegetically in Unreal Engine so that's kind of part of the next phase is having Evan the composer do sound design where it's like you know there are a lot of sound cues in the novel like crickets like from across the garden but then you know we can like place them within the world but also like mess with like fully sound and have like the crickets be like you know something you know whatever so kind of like we're, we're gonna really fuck with that a bit and then I don't know then I have like yeah just like other products that are like all like period things but then like one of them I guess sort of it's like uh, drifting into like you guys territory but um this a film that has like a very long conversation that takes place in Berlin Tiergarten and the conversations about these monuments and it's like a based on like a historical conversation between two thinkers and like want to make these like monuments like shift as they're talking because they're talking about like programs of abstraction and representation in relationship to like politics at like right after World War One. so um and like it's like black American thinkers talking about like German like nation building and be like yeah or no <laughs> and so um so yeah, I think it's a really useful set of tools. I never thought that I would be interested in continuing to use them, but for like very specific projects, which is like half of the work, I guess, that I'm I'm doing, um, it feels really cool to play with. Um, so yeah. Monuments. Yeah. Monuments at this point. Is that I don't know about three D animation. We we had our fill. <laughs> yeah, so we're okay. <laughs> Oh, we're yeah, definitely, we... definitely burned out on money. No, you go sure. Um, but 3D animation is, is super interesting and exciting. Um, I think like they were talking about earlier, like this idea of savage philosophy, that, you know, representation makes reality. And to think about like what the potential for, you know, virtual worlds and virtual representations and, and how those can influence the, the physical real world uh, in, in deeper and profound ways. Um, and just like a specific use case we're thinking about for a feature film we're working on now, um, it's like there's photogrammetry and there's also like LIDAR, which is um, a little bit more highly detailed and a wider range instead of a specific object um, uh, using lasers. Uh, it's often used in, in archaeology. Um, and so been experimenting with that because uh, it, it can make really high resolution scans of entire environments. Um, including like forests and other types of spaces uh, and create sort of like point clouds of, of billions of, of points um, that can be manipulated. And I think it's a really interesting way of perceiving the world in a, in a way that we can't with our own human senses and to, to think about um, sort of other than human entities and how um, 
their vision or experience of reality might be uh, represented using these technologies. Also trying to make a, uh, you know, Veggie Tales. We're gonna try to make an NRO kind of Veggie Tales where it's a talking curry verse, and a Bavarian pretzel and an Aperol spritz. It's kind of similar to your German thing, Aria. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> in German, there's this huge obsession with native culture. Hmm. We kind of have like this all this writing and thinking that we want to do engage with it and thinking that like a 3D animated talking food mm -hmm. educational kid show might be the best way to get into it. So be on the lookout for that one. I feel like Veggie Tales is a good way to end in this <laughs> strange, perfectly surreal sense. Um, thank you, Jackson, Adam, Zach, Aria, for being here with us and for sharing your work and thoughts. Thank you, the studio. Thank you to all of you for being here. Um, hope to see you at our next screening. Till next time. Thanks so much for putting us together. Yeah, thank you. Great. Of course. Thank you. So nice to be in dialogue with you, Aria. Yeah. Later. Bye. Bye.